the Director of Education for the Partnership for Maternal and Child Health of Northern New Jersey, which is providing today's program. Our webinar today is titled Reducing the Risk of Sudden Unexpected Infant Death, Social, Health, and Behavioral Determinants. I would like to review some information before we get started. An hour after the webinar ends, you will receive an email with a link to post-program evaluation. Please complete the survey to provide us with feedback on the program. To receive a certificate of completion, you must listen to the entire webinar and complete the evaluation survey. Certificates of completion will be sent via email within one week of the webinar broadcast. This program is being recorded and will be available on the Partnership's YouTube channel. We will be muting all attendees' microphones during the presentation, but we would love to hear from you. Please write questions in the question box and the speaker will res respond to as many as possible at the conclusion of the presentation. Now I would like to introduce today's speaker. Dr. Barbara Otzfeld is a professor of pediatrics at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and program director of the SIDS Center of New Jersey, which she helped establish in 1987. She is a nationally recognized expert on sudden unexpected infant death and her research contributed to the safe infant sleep policies of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Her activities also address racial disparities in health and she serves as a member of the New Jersey Perinatal Quality Collaborative Health Disparities Workgroup and the New Jersey First Ladies Nurture New Jersey Initiative. For her work, Dr. Osfeld was recently honored as champion for children by the New Jersey chapter of the American Academy of Pediatrics. Dr. Osfeld credits her seven grandchildren with sustaining her commitment to infant health and safety. And our, the planners and speaker have no financial disclosures to make. And um, I would like to now introduce Dr. Osfeld. Sarah, thank you so much. And hi, everyone. I think I see virtually see a, a lot of uh, familiar faces and names. And I'm so grateful for your time. I wanna thank you all because there is so much more that we can do to reduce the risk of sudden infant death syndrome and other sleep related infant deaths. And you are the engine that drives this train. While New Jersey's rates of sudden unexpected infant deaths are among the lowest in the US, we can and we must do even better. So I, I'm very, very grateful for your time today. This slide is a preview of the risk reducing strategies that we're going to be discussing. And yes, as you all well know, the SID Center of New Jersey reaches hospitals and clinics, social service programs, child care providers, first responders, home visitors, doulas, faith based communities, and so on and so on. But all of you here today, are our most important, most effective providers of this information to our New Jersey families, including many who are at highest risk. You each have the relationship of trust with families that is essential, not just to increase knowledge, but most importantly, to change behavior. What we teach families, what we demonstrate, and how we do it can save lives because the deaths that we're going to be discussing today are largely preventable and you have the power to make a difference. And during the talk, I'll be mentioning numbers. And as I always say, I think it's important for us just to take a moment to respect every number represents a child who is born to hopeful parents. And because of the work we all do, and some of us for deeply personal reasons as well, we all appreciate what grief means, we all get it. And on the slide that you're looking at, I've posted an etching, it's of grieving parents that was drawn 100 years ago, and a poem that was written 1,000 years ago by an elderly father in China who was remembering his loss, loss of, a, of his son many years earlier in his life. So across a lifespan, across culture, across time, we feel it, no translation needed. And this is what fuels our passion, yours and mine, for the work we do and our passion to get it right. In the U.S., from 1980 to 1988 alone, nearly 50,000 babies died with a death classified as sudden infant death syndrome. 
That's an average of about 6,000 deaths a year. And then came research and legislation and programs and safe sleep policies and national safe sleep campaigns like Back to Sleep and Safe to Sleep. And you can see in this slide, as unsafe sleep practices in the United States declined, and that's the dropping pink line, the rate of SIDS also began to drop dramatically. And these days, SIDS has fallen from 6,000 deaths a year to about 1,300 deaths a year annually in the United States. And even if we broaden the U.S. count to include the larger group that we now call sudden unexpected infant deaths, there still has been an enormous decline. In other words, evidence-based public health interventions work. And although our sudden unexpected infant death rates in New Jersey have been among the lowest, there's even more that each of us can do. And the conversation that we will have now tells us what we need to know to accomplish that. And like good scientists, we're going to begin with some definitions. And I'm sure many of you know this, these definitions, but it bears reflecting because it tells a story. The words tell a lot of the story that we're dealing with. Baby dies suddenly and unexpectedly, and they're whisked off into the medical examiner system. And we're talking about a baby in the first 12 months of life. And after a thorough evaluation, death scene investigation, autopsy, metabolic, anatomic, genetic, review of the clinical history, if there is no answer, no explanation can be found, that's what SIDS is. Definition, sudden, unexpected death of a seemingly healthy baby that remains unexplained even after that, that thorough review. I could also call it, I don't know why my baby died syndrome, which is a horror to every parent because if you've ever sat with a family that's had a loss, what's the first question out of their mouths? Why? And for these families, there will never be a satisfactory answer. The explanation could not be identified. Research reveals new findings, emerging diagnoses, but the large chunk that remains SIDS means deaths for which no explanation has yet been found. Now, some of the deaths actually turn out after that review to be due to a previously undetected medical condition like a fulminating pneumonia or a cardiac anomaly, and they're whisked off into medical categories. But by and large, most of them remain under this umbrella called sudden unexpected infant death. SIDS, the second category I'll highlight is ill-defined and unknown causes. It's somewhat like SIDS, but it may contain other factors. Maybe the medical examiner couldn't find every in, bit of information necessary to rule everything out. Or maybe there were medical conditions, but they really didn't rise to the level of causality. Uncertainty reigns. Couldn't find an answer. And that tends to get categorized in that big, enormous, um, uh, 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 broad-ranging category. And then there's a third category that has emerged because of better death scene investigation, and that's accidental suffocation. And it means that something in the death scene has risen to the level of causality. It doesn't mean that there's a pillow in one side of the crib and a baby on the other. I mean, you may have a, a pillow present and there may be a risk associated with that. For example, as we'll see in a few slides, if a baby uh, is lying next to the pillow, but could move and turn his head, but for some reason doesn't. Um, that's a different situation than if a baby is lying head compressed in a pillow with an adult lying on top of it and is unable to move about. Anybody in that situation would have died. And if that condition didn't exist, this baby would be alive. And so we reach, we make a decision about accidental suffocation when it rises to the level of causality. Now, why do we link all of these three? Well, for one, there's been diagnosis drift, medical examiner to medical examiner and state to state over the years. And if we want to see that SIDS is truly declining and not just declining because other categories are being preferentially used, we really have to make sure that the entire grouping of SUID is declining. And that's one of the main factors. The other factor that's very important is that they share similar risk factors. So when you address the risks related to SIDS, you are also reducing the risk of these other deaths. 
as I said, New Jersey is low relative to the nation. We're third lowest in the most recently finalized data for, new, for uh, the United States, which is 2018. And you could see that our rate is uh, practically half that of the nation. Our rate is in green. And you can also see from the previous uh, two, two uh, three-year period, 15 to 17, to the most current, that we have continued uh, to decline. But we should also emphasize that there are racial disparities, and these are disparities that are found across lifespan health issues, whether we're looking at cardiac events, cancer in the lifespan, whether we're looking at issues specific to the sector that we all work in, fetal mortality, maternal mortality, short gestation, congenital anomalies, maternal complication deaths, and SIDS, there is racial disparity. And we're going to take time to address that as well in our conversation. As I mentioned, these are deaths, sudden unexpected infant deaths relate to a definition that addresses the first 12 months of life. 90% of these deaths occur within the first six months. It's rare after that. Uh, and it's very rare in the first month of life in New Jersey or in, in the United States, rather about 11% uh, of these deaths occur in the first month, even rarer in the first week, although they do occur. We think of the safe sleep recommendation that we're gonna be diving into as what I call the low hanging fruit. They are under immediate control. We can act upon it. We don't have to wait for systems or anything to change. It is within our control. But there's a reason why certain groups are more vulnerable than others to these unsafe sleep conditions. And the factors that increase vulnerability precede uh, the action steps of safe infant sleep. They address lifespan issues, prenatal health, mother's health before pregnancy, and health issues and challenges within pregnancy. We're talking about preterm birth and smoke exposure and social determinants of poverty and discrimination and maternal health, for example. So we're going to take a look at that for a few moments. But first I wanna emphasize how we all, we fit that puzzle together. And we look at what's called the triple risk model for SIDS. Three things are necessary. The pink bubble tells us that these are deaths that occur in the first 12 months of life by definition. But thank goodness, virtually every baby, most every baby makes it through. You clearly need more than just the age span. You need the next bubble, the blue one. It turns out that babies who die from SIDS are more likely than babies who die from any other condition to have a vulnerability. And one of the prime vulnerabilities under study is an anomaly in the brainstem, in the part of the brainstem called the arcuate nucleus. And a vulnerability in that area renders the baby less sensitive to drops in oxygen. So if they're lying and rebreathing oxygen poor air, let's say next to a pillow, a pillow they could move away from without any trouble, um, they're not going to get that catecholamine surge. They're not going to arouse, wake up, and do what every baby can do from birth on, which is move and turn the head and they would continue to lie, rebreathe, and have that challenge. But nothing's happened yet. That potentially vulnerable baby is still fine. And by the way, those vulnerabilities are still undetectable in life. You need the third bubble, the yellow one. You need an extrinsic risk, an exogenous risk factor or cluster of risks that exacerbate that vulnerability in this critical period of time. An example, a baby lying belly down in soft bedding. If it's a vulnerable baby in this time period, you've got a challenge. And so we can't change the vulnerability. You can't undo the months of life, but you can remove the risks that create the challenge. And when you do, not only have you reduced the risk of SIDS, but for completely different reasons, you've also reduced the risk of accidental suffocation and the ill-defined and unknown causes. And just to drill one level deeper out of respect for the work that we all do, um, I want to um, direct you to the, these three um, cuts of uh, babies, three brain slides, baby, two babies on the right um, died of uh, traumatic conditions and the baby on the left died of SIDS. And the circled area is the part we're talking about. And you'll notice that the two babies who died traumatically uh, have an area of cells that are green stained and those are uh, cells that pick up the neurotransmitter serotonin 
and you don't see that in the baby who died of SIDS. There really is a difference in that area and without adequate serotonin, the production challenges, the transport challenges, the reuptake challenges and all that ensue mean that this area of the brain is not operating optimally. If you have ever wondered as a professional, do you have an impact? Does the work that you do make a difference? I hope you will remember this slide. In 1992, the United States primarily put its babies to sleep on their bellies, largely because of the advice that was given over a period of decades by a highly respected pediatrician, Dr. Benjamin Spock. And much that he did has, has stood the test of time, but not his commentary about sleep position. He said, put your babies on their bellies or they'll choke based on note evidence, and there continues to be no evidence. And even with the back to sleep campaign in place for so many decades now, there has been no increased risk in aspiration deaths. Nevertheless, that's what he said, people complied. So if you look at 1992, that big red ribbon, about three quarters of America's babies sleeping on their bellies in that period. Then came a true assessment of the research of what went into raising the risk of SIDS uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics their initial policy statement, and we were off to a very different and dramatic change. By 1994, the NICHD came out with its Back to Sleep campaign. You saw the red ribbon begin to drop, and in its place, side, the yellow and blue, the uh, Back to Sleep position began to rise. People were listening. And then in 1996, data, including our data, demonstrated that the side position was quite vulnerable. And when a baby was put in that position, they tended to tip, highly likely. And when they tipped, they were much more likely to tip to belly than back. So it's as though nothing were done. And no, the American Academy of Pediatrics did not want you to roll up blankets and stick them in either side of the baby so they wouldn't move because the blanket becomes a risk in itself. So in 1996, the guidance changed. Back to sleep was the recommended uh, way to go. And you saw something very dramatic happening. You saw the blue ribbon singularly rising and both the yellow and red dropping. So that by the year 2000 in the United States, three quarters of America's babies were now being put to sleep on their backs. That is an incredibly dramatic change in human behavior in an exquisitely short period of time as public health issues go. And how did it happen? It happened because of people in positions like yours who were able to respectfully communicate this guidance with families and encourage families to consider making a difference. And Back to Sleep has been termed one of the seven leading research findings in pediatrics in the last 40 years because of its impact on survival. You all know that telling people stuff is not enough. You can change knowledge, but knowledge doesn't automatically mean we change behavior. Lots of people know we shouldn't be smoking and lots of people, because it's an addiction, continue to do so. We have to inspire people. We have to invest the learner in the merit of the subject regarding the topic we're talking about today, a leading cause of infant mortality. You have to invest the learner in the merit of the information. This stuff works. And you have to invest the learner in their power to make a difference. We can pray and hope our babies will be well and safe, but how wonderful it is to have in our power something we can do to help that along. And ultimately, what you want to change is not just knowledge, but behavior. And so we often ask families, not what do you know, but what do you do and why? And that begins a very respectful conversation. But before dipping into the uh, safe sleep guidance and updates on that, I want to take a moment to go back to the antecedent risks that create that vulnerable baby in the first place. And what I did here is perform some statistical magic. Oh, if I could wave a magic wand and perform this magic in real life on real babies, we'd be done. And what I did here in our New Jersey data is uh, I average a 10 year period uh, and I asked for uh, our rates of sudden unexpected infant death. And you could see here that uh, there's variation, uh, racial and ethnic uh, group to group. Uh, but there you see the pattern and you see the disparities. And now I'm going to create some magic. I'm going to eliminate uh, smoking risk. I'm going to eliminate risk of poverty. That's something we'll talk about. Uh, education level and marital status are called 
statistical proxies for poverty. And I'm going to make everybody full term. And that's the dark blue bar. And you see that in each group, the rate of sudden unexpected infant death has dropped dramatically. And you also see that the disparities have been reduced. And I can keep doing this. Now in the green bar, I've also given everybody adequate prenatal care. And you see the disparity going down again and the rates going down again. So let's take a look at some of those issues. And as I talk about poverty, I wanna make it clear that I'll be getting to a slide in a few minutes where I clarify removing poverty when we talk about issues of racial disparity is a step, but it is far from enough. And we'll address that in a moment. Poverty correlates to our sudden unexpected infant death rates. The higher the poverty level, the worse the death rates. And I just created a, a slide on the left, the one with all those blue circles that represent our counties uh, and two major cities. Uh, and what we see here is that as income drops, the, the sudden unexpected infant death rate rises. And you can, you can plug that in, in national data, other data, I just used our New Jersey data. I want to address each of the antecedent risk issues in terms of racial disparity. And so if you look to the right, you'll see this is national data, but we can re reproduce this on state levels, um, that if you look at income over the years and break it down by race and ethnicity, our black families are earning at a lower rate and even at their highest earning points, it is lower than the other groups. Why does poverty matter? What is the magic ingredient of poverty? Well, there's less access to prenatal care. People may work all day, get home. They don't have proper transportation to get to evening appointments. Uh, there may be food injustice. Uh, access to good nutritional food may be lacking in an accessible area. And some of the processed food that's available may, as you know, be high in sodium, not a great thing for a pregnancy. Um, there may be poor preconceptional health because access again may be limited. And you know, we always encourage that first prenatal visit as early as possible, but it's not a magical visit. And if you're addressing management of diabetes and other conditions, high blood pressure, it's so important over the course of lifespan antecedently to get those conditions under control. Smoking you would think would not be a factor related to poverty because it's expensive, but it is a relatively inexpensive guilty pleasure. And in fact, there is more smoking with lower income. And there is more substandard housing. So guess what? If you're not smoking, but your neighbor is, guess what? You're smoking also. And substandard housing can be in areas that where there is a contamination, such as higher lead levels, which is associated with a greater risk of babies being born small for gestational age. Uh, and that in combination with prematurity is a very uh, significant concern for the work that we all do. Uh, there is more fatigue with a complicated lifestyle, higher crime in some of these areas, govern decisions that are made about safe sleep. And I'll point that out in a, in a moment. And there is of course more stress associated with this. With a $1 increase in the minimum wage, this was a study done a few years ago, you see measurable drops in the rate of these deaths. This is a screenshot I took a few years ago. And I took it because it was profound and it was rare. I am very sad to say, horrified to say, something we all know it is less rare today. There are drive-by shootings in high crime areas. And when we sit with families living in these areas, uh, stuck because of issues related to poverty, uh, they will tell us, look, I know that bed sharing is a risk factor, but I'm afraid to put my baby any way away from me because I'm living in an area that has drive-by shootings. I also have an unresponsive landlord. We have vermin. He's not responding to me. I have to weigh all the risks. And when I weigh all of that, I feel my baby is safer in bed with me. Who should have to make such a choice? Who should have to make such a choice? But as I said, poverty is not the magic answer. And it's almost disrespectful to think that that's what it's all about. And this is one of a thousand slides I could have plugged in here that reproduce the same story. We look at adverse birth outcomes. And for the, our conversation, we look at low birth weight. And you could see in our white babies, 
that as uh, poverty diminishes, as we move above the poverty line, I don't know if you can see my uh, icon moving around on the screen here, but you'll see that a white baby in poverty has a higher percentage of low birth weight compared to a white baby that's gone above the poverty line. And the same thing for our black infants, that a black infant in poverty has a higher percentage of low birth weight and it drops when, that, when black babies are above the poverty line. But please note something else. A black infant above the poverty line still has a higher likelihood of being low birth weight compared to a white infant below the poverty line. Back in 2003, the Institute of Medicine in instituted a report, initiated a report, and they said the majority of studies find that racial and ethnic disparities remain even after adjustment for socioeconomic differences and other healthcare access related factors. And one of the things that we have come to appreciate has impact is the issue we now term implicit bias and that we're all working so hard to address. And this is a study that was done just a few years ago, uh, included in the grouping doing this study was the Robert Wood Johnson Foundation. And what they found was, uh, this is, these are surveys uh, that were given out to African Americans. And those who avoided mental, medical care because they anticipated that there was going to be racial discrimination measured to the level of 22% of the grouping. 22% of African Americans said they avoided medical care because they anticipated discrimination. We think how hard we work to convince people to go, that it's healthy to go and so forth, but it's much more complicated than knowing that I'll be healthier. It's also anticipating what I may encounter when I go. And I actually left a word out. I want to go back to that slide. Uh, this is a term that we're hearing more and more about. Cultural competence was something that we have been heard, and he, heard we have heard about for many years and continues to be part of the dialogue. But there's also called, something called cultural humidity, humility. Um, cultural competence implies a capacity to be competent in cultures other than your own. And that certainly is a goal. But cultural humi humility has a, a very powerful resonating message. We can understand and respect and continue to learn and appreciate that there are differences that we need to know more about. And so it's a term that I've been paying more attention to. Preterm birth is a major risk elevator of sudden unexpected infant death. This is a national study we did a few years ago. And uh, if you take a look down at the cutting edge of life, and I don't know how many in the audience today are uh, people who spend their careers as I have done in the neonatal intensive care units. Um, but you know that at the cutting edge of life, 24 to 27 weeks, so much goes into keeping those babies alive and reaching a point of discharge and they go home only to be at higher risk for sudden unexpected infant death, nearly four times at uh, the risk compared to a full-term baby. And even the late preterm baby uh, is at high risk compared to a full-term baby. It's why we spend so much time making sure that our families in the NICU are receiving that same safe sleep education. It's a very important group. I wanna bring it back to disparity. This is the most recent uh, March of Dimes Peristats report card. This is for New Jersey. And you can see that our black infants remain at higher risk for a preterm birth. Uh, New Jersey's grade was a C plus. Newark's grade was an F. Um, many, many challenges to healthcare and, and all of those factors. And so it's a challenging situation. And I should point out with respect to the work we do with sudden unexpected infant death. In 2018, about 9% of New Jersey's births were below 37 weeks of gestation, but 32% of our 2018 SUID cases were preterm. It's a major risk elevator. The other uh, antecedent risk I want to emphasize is prenatal smoking. Uh, this is, again, a national study we did, and you look at these are survivors, in other words, living babies, um, about uh, almost 9% of mothers were smoking in pregnancy, but then take a look at the percentage of mothers smoking in pregnancy with sudden unexpected infant death or any of its components, and you see that it's a fourfold higher uh, percentage. 
every cigarette matters. This was a study with the colleagues of ours, so we did, didn't participate in the study, but we were absolutely delighted with the way they went about approaching this, uh, these analytics. Every cigarette matters, and it's estimated that with respect to sudden un unexpected infant deaths, uh, you could reduce these by 22% if no woman smoked in pregnancy. Other studies have demonstrated that household smoke matters also. Uh, and we also remain concerned that 55% of smokers did not reduce their smoking in pregnancy. I should also point out, and this is a fairly new study, uh, that if you combine uh, smoking with alcohol, then that combined risk for SIDS increases enormously. There's a 12-fold greater risk. This is New Jersey's data. And if you take a look at the risk of sudden unexpected infant death among mothers who didn't smoke compared to mothers who did smoke in pregnancy, there's a six-fold greater risk. So smoking matters so much. And even in certain in circumstances where the parent is not smoking and it's secondhand smoke, we have to become very mindful of what the source is. This is a national uh, assessment done a few years ago. What they were looking at is measuring metabolites in the blood of non-smokers. And they were measurable. Clearly, there is some secondhand exposure. And it was more so in the Black individuals in this study. These are non-smokers. So we have to be very mindful of the environment. Bringing it back to um, sudden unexpected infant death, we know that if one mother, uh, if one parent smokes, rather, there's a higher risk of both parents smoke, the risk blossoms. We know too from our uh, study we did a number of years ago that if the mother smoked, 86% of fathers also smoked. That's an open invitation to the father to participate in that smoking. And so education needs to go on to both parents. We can't just single the mother out as the only individual to receive guidance and help and risk reducing, reducing assistance. To bring it back to racial disparity, uh, this is a study, these, actually this is the behavioral risk factor survey that's done. Uh, and I took a look at our New Jersey uh, statistics for 2014 to 2016, our males from 35 to 44. And we see that there's a higher percentage of smoking in our black males compared to our white males. It's gone up for our black males, it went down for our white males. We have to make sure that our state programs like MomsQuick.com, uh, a wonderful statewide program, um, is reaching everybody. It is a statewide program. Opportunity exists for everyone. Everybody should take advantage of those resources. And uh, these are folks, um, Dr. Chris Del Nevo, uh, for example, uh, at Rutgers at the Center for Tobacco Studies that also engage in work that is very relevant to the challenges that we all face. Obstetricians address smoking. Uh, they look at it at women before they become pregnant in the first, second, and third trimester and after. But it is a, a situation that bears improving. About 91% of our obstetricians are addressing it with women before pregnancy. But you could see that across trimesters, it goes down, way down after birth. And if you look at those who are in the uh, parent's environment, secondhand smoker exposures, they are getting less of that questioning. And there is a real need for the messaging to go out there. And finally, with preconceptional health, um, this is taking a look at this top slide of women um, who are uh, at or over 30 years of age and who have evidence of periodontal disease. And you can see here that there is racial disparity. This was a national study. So more of our black women are experiencing this. We don't want to have periodontal disease uh, in pregnancy. Uh, and it's a challenge to treat because, you know, you poke around and you're proliferating bacteria and raising inflammation and so forth. So prenatal healthy lifespan dental care, so important. And that's why this uh, bottom uh, slide or bottom uh, graph here matters too. This is taking a look at racial disparity in New Jersey women. Uh, and I looked at our young mothers, young women, uh, who did not have a dental visit in the past year. And you could see that there's racial disparity there. We question access to care, implicit bias, and all of those issues. But let's take a look now at the low-hanging fruit. 
uh, the things that we can do, all of those other issues, the antecedent, social, adverse social and health issues are things that the SID Center of New Jersey has long been involved in addressing and working on with collaborators, so many of you as well. These are public health, pro complex programs and interventions. The uh, more immediate impact, something as I said at the start, that we have more immediate control over has to do with safe sleep education. And these are uh, brochures from the NICHD. Uh, we can send those out to you, as you all know. Um, and all of these guidances are based on the uh, evidence-based recommendations and policy statements, <clears throat> pardon me, <clears throat> of the American Academy of Pediatrics for the first 12 months of life. I'm just gonna take a sip of water. I have done that. <clears throat> Hopefully my voice will be less scratchy in a moment. <clears throat> and I want to do a very quick um, summary description for you. And I'm going to use the NICHD Slate Safe uh, to Sleep uh, um, poster for this purpose. What constitutes a safe infant sleep environment? Well, rooming in, the baby should be sharing your room at least for the first six months of life, ideally the first 12 months of life. The baby should be sleeping in a crib, bassinet, or portable crib that meets current Consumer Product Safety Commission standards, and you can access that through their 800 number. What should be in that crib? It should be a mattress of the type intended for that product. Now, why is that said now? Well, some cribs stimulate people to want to buy an aftermarket mattress. An example is a, a mesh-sided portable crib. They are fine. They meet current standards. They're absolutely fine. They come with thin mattresses. And sometimes people were motivated to take a look and say, well, I'm going to go out and get a real thick mattress for my baby. And they get one that's six, eight, ten inches thick and plop it in. Mesh is pliant. The baby leans against it, it pushes out, and a V of space is created between that thick mattress and the mesh, and a baby can fall in, and yes, there have been deaths like that. So all manufacturers point out the type of mattress used should be the kind intended for that product. And even with a regular crib, if one replaces it with a mattress that's too small and there are gaps, that runs a risk for a baby. What should be on that mattress? Just a tightly fitted sheet, no pillows or blankets or quilts under it or over it. Who should be in there? Just the baby, you know, guests. The baby should be placed to sleep on the back for the first 12 months of life. The usual response appropriately is, wait a minute, wait a minute, at some point that baby is going to be rolling over. What should I do about that? And the answer is, initiate sleep for the first 12 months of life on the back. At some point, generally by six months of age, a baby develops two skills. They can roll from back to belly and from belly to back. When both of those skills are present, and I don't mean as accidental skills, but as true skills, you can place the baby on his back. The baby may say, if he's a brilliant baby, or think, gee, thanks, mom and dad. But, you know, I've developed a preference now for my side, so I'll be moving in that direction. But it's okay because I have full control over rolling in both directions. That's different from a one-month-old who's uh, crying lustily and somehow has managed to flip himself over. He's as surprised as you are. Um, and so uh, the baby should be in um, a condition where there is nothing else in the bed, no bumpers, no blankets, no pillows, and so many of our death scenes have multiple pillows, not even just one. No loose bedding of any kind, no stuffed animals of any kind, what if it's cold? What if you feel you need to add layers? Wearable blankets. They can zip up. If they do have a zipper, you want to flap a fabric on top so the baby doesn't wind up sucking on the edge of the zipper. Uh, it can have snaps. It can be sleeveless or with sleeves, thick or thin, depending upon your need. It can have legs or it can be sack-like. Uh, and that is a safe way to go. And it should be the right size. With poverty, sometimes people buy very large and the baby could kind of sink in like a head, headless uh, uh, wearable blanket. You don't want that. Um, and that is the recommendation. And it's also important to recognize that in keeping a baby from being cold, we don't want to go in the other direction and overheat. Overheating is actually a risk elevator for a variety of metabolic uh, reasons uh, that are beyond the scope of our conversation today. But 
overheating is a risk elevator. And so we want to make sure uh, that we are keeping our babies comfortable. You can tell by touch or blue nails or blue lips if a baby's cold, and you can also tell by touch if a baby feels overheated uh, and so forth. So uh, that is a very important element too. Bed sharing is not recommended by the American Academy of Pediatrics, but they do strongly indicate, yes, you're feeding your baby, you want to bring your baby into bed night to nurse your baby because breastfeeding is associated with a reduced risk of sudden unexpected infant death. Bring your baby into bed to, meet, to feed, to nurture, to comfort. Make sure in case you fall asleep while doing so that you've removed your pillows and your loose bedding. Uh, when you're done, place that baby back in his safe sleep condition. Look at the picture on the left, and you could see the mama can still hold, touch, see, smell the baby, but that baby is afforded a safety from untoward results of loose bedding falling uh, over the face or deeply asleep parent inadvertently uh, rolling onto the baby in some, uh, in some manner. So uh, bed sharing under the conditions of bringing the baby in for comforting, but then returning that baby to share your room, but not your bed, but certainly be in proximity uh, to, to your bed. No smoking, absolutely. Never use a chair or a sofa to sleep baby, either alone or with you. Untoward events happen as a result of that. And that's one of the reasons, too, why the Academy has said at night, if you're bringing your baby into bed to, to nurse, it may be safer than going and sitting on a chair or sofa and falling asleep that way. But remember, move, remove your loose and soft bedding and return that baby to, next to your bed when you are done. If you fall asleep for a few minutes, when you awake, then return the baby then. When you discuss safe infant sleep, your messages need to be clear consistent because people who see contradictory messages, and this is, pertains to all of us on any healthcare issue, um, begin to react with concern. Well, if people are not sure about what to do, uh, why should I feel confident in what, in what they're telling me? Repetition matters. The more we hear a message from trusted sources, the more that we feel confident. And it's important to be respectful. People come to their decisions for so many different reasons. Nobody comes to decisions because they want to be oppositional. There's usually a basis for the reason, family history, culture, whatever, and in learning it, we can continue that conversation respectfully. We also have to make sure in safe sleep education that we are including in some way the influencers of parents, and that may mean uh, grandparents, for example, and I as a grandmother can assure you that we do have influence. And the challenge with grandparents is that unless you do the work we all do, uh, they may not have realized that there are changes in the guidance about safe infant sleep. They may not have stepped into a pediatrician's office in 25 or more years. And so an educated parent, new parent can come home, put that baby on the back, and a caring grandparent comes over, takes a look, and is horrified and says, what are you doing? Put that baby on his belly or he'll choke. I raised all of you on your bellies and you are fine. And as you know, if you've heard me have this conversation before, we say not fine, lucky. You know, in public health, you can do everything wrong. You can um, drive without a seatbelt. You can eat bacon three times a day and never exercise a day in your life and yet live to be 100. You can do all sorts of things wrong and still come out okay, but you have a much better chance if you follow what has been learned in public health research. And so who wants to play chance with a baby. And so the guidance is very important and we need to bring in those who have influence. We also need to respect barriers. We'll address fear of, aspira of aspiration or perceived lack of comfort. Oh, I don't like to sleep on my belly. I'm comfortable on my back. The baby must be, uh, or, or, I'm sorry, I, I don't like to sleep on my back. I'm more comfortable on my belly. So I think my baby would be too. But the truth is, if, uh, if you have ever worked with families who've helped make sure their babies are sleeping on their backs, being put to sleep on their backs, you know that when they're engaging in tummy time when awake to help those babies develop those muscles, always awake and supervised by you, um, that in the beginning, a back sleeping baby will be highly insulted and start crying and be irritable and they're kind of looking for their ceiling. And why are they uncomfortable? Because they're used to the back and we get calls and we say, hang in, they will get used to it, and, and of course they do. 
or sometimes a parent who is not in a high risk group feels, well, I must be safe because uh, my racial group or my income group is not at risk. Well, you may be at lower risk, but tragically, sudden unexpected and for death is a full opportunity catastrophe. It can be for anyone, even though some groups are higher than others. And there also may be misplaced confidence by that by being vigilant, you'll pay attention. Oh, I, I know that my, I'm going to be okay because uh, I'm lying down on the sofa with my baby, but I'm paying attention. Um, and the reality is, and there, there is uh, public evidence of this, uh, there's a uh, uh, a pediatric cardiologist, Dr. Sam Hankey in Cleveland, um, who has done public service announcements because he lay down with his baby on his sofa, well-intentioned and experienced the, the worst tragedy uh, and points out no matter what our good intention, we have to recognize that some conditions, some circumstances are beyond our control. And if you're tired, don't be lying down with that baby uh, in that, uh, on that uh, sofa. Uh, and so we, we can't always assume that we're going to be vigilant and it'll work under all conditions. If we're sleepy, we want to get that baby into a safe sleep situation first. Uh, and a sleep deprived parent may make decisions about sleep location that have more to do with getting the baby to sleep longer. And we know that with belly down, there is longer sleep because some of the wake sleep cycles are diminished, but actually that's not a great thing. The biological basis for those cycles is important. It helps us make sure that we are waking to, to breastfeed our babies again appropriately. Uh, and so it should not be a contest. And doesn't it feel like it is that sometimes that my baby slept so long, uh, my baby slept the night in two seconds, or my baby slept the night in one second. That's not the goal. And so we have to really be mindful of what you know, the true goal is. Um, we have developed, as many of you know, a safe infant sleep app called SIDS Info. Uh, it's available in English and Spanish. It's free. It can be downloaded to any type of cell phone. Um, it has uh, voiceover um, as well as writing, it, and the voiceover is now in English and Spanish, so literacy is not an issue. Uh, this is the, the infographic we created on our Facebook page for it. And it has been a game changer that has actually gone all over the country and is now uh, being uh, advanced by AmCHIP, uh, as well as the NICHD campaign. And so nurses have been using it as a script to help educate families and then helping families download it uh, so they can go home and use it as a refresher or share with others who take care of their babies. Uh, and we find that Rich or poor, everybody has access to a phone these days. It cuts across generational lines, racial, ethnic, and income lines. Uh, you know that we also provide all other manner of resources. Uh, and if you go to our Facebook page, and I can send this uh, to Sarah to distribute to all of you after, so you have access and you don't have to scribble it down right now, uh, but we can help and we are delighted to continue to provide uh, as many resources as possible. Just a brief statement about COVID-19. Um, a newborn may be released to the care of others. If there's any a, a crisis within the home, you wanna make sure that all who receive the baby are aware of safe sleep education. We also know that with everybody being in their own bubble, relatives and other helpers who usually hover around a new family to help uh, an exhausted parent may not be available. And with exhaustion, sometimes uh, there's a loss of focus on safe sleep. We want to make sure that we're helping keeping that in the forefront of thought. If there are any questions about room sharing or breastfeeding related to COVID, we urge everyone to ask their healthcare provider. The guidance changes constantly, but the, the information is most typically reassuring. Uh, and so that should be the resource that one reaches out to uh, their healthcare provider. Uh, and we also want to make sure that if a baby is going elsewhere other than home, that there is access to appropriate safe sleep uh, equipment. Never assume that somebody else is doing your work, our work, my work. That somehow or other between the pediatrician, the daycare center, or whatever, that families are getting information and that they're getting accurate information. This is a slide of a study done in pediatrics in 2017 that found that um, there can be no advice it's in 20% of cases, but even worse, it can be incorrect advice. So everybody's voice matters. 
Let's talk about some of the challenges. I mentioned this one before, uh, that if we're working with grandparents, we have to recognize they worked with a different model and grandparents therefore are uh, less compliant with guidance and we need to have that respectful conversation. <clears throat> we also need to be aware if we're participating in hospital life, uh, that it's not only the talking the talk, but it's walking the walk. This is an example uh, before audits took place. Uh, and obviously this is modeling the worst possible scenario. And so what we want to make sure is that we, that our uh, bassinets are pristine and providing the right example for our families. Um, you have uh, the opportunity to recognize what's going on in your hospitals and to make sure that everything good is going on, that there are safe sleep policies in place, that there are audits to review periodically if you're conducting good safe sleep education with your families, if you're demonstrating it and so forth, if there are pro protocols for how you're addressing parent education, um, if there is a chart uh, documentation, because that's something that's absolutely important, uh, if there's a protocol for continuing education, as we're doing today. Um, if there's education material, what it, what is it? One nice thing about our free app we've learned is it doesn't get lost. You know, we still give out lots of flyers, but in a busy home of a new baby, that can get lost in a couple of minutes. Your cell phone may get lost, but we all get hysterical when that happens, and in five minutes we find it again. So the app remains accessible. Um, and we also want to make sure that in any program connected to our hospitals, like follow-up clinics, that we're also reminding our families. Now, you may be wondering what Jennifer Lopez and Kim Kardashian are doing helping in our education today. And actually, they're providing a good public health service because they're showing us that social norms have, in fact, been changing. And these are, this has nothing to do about their parenting behavior. Their parenting behavior seems fine and lovely, but it is a demonstration of how people's reactions to parenting has changed. Uh, 13 years ago, Jennifer Lopez had newborns. They were featured in a popular magazine uh, for staging of the shot. The cribs were dolled up with all kinds of excessive fluffy bedding and magnificent stuffed animals and what have you. And the reaction to that was, oh, how beautiful. How can I get that? Where can I find that animal? Where can I get that pretty Betty? And fast forward about 10 years and Kim Kardashian had uh, her four, fourth baby and on social media, she posted a picture and it was in suboptimal uh, safe sleep circumstances that appeared at least from the picture and people began reacting uh, almost immediately. Oh, this is not safe. What are you doing? And so forth to the point where uh, she responded and explained the circumstances of the picture. 10 years, a massive difference in how people are viewing it. Bear is beautiful. Uh, the crib with the baby sleeping in an empty situation, but safely versus all that stuff in uh, the crib on the left. Boppy pillows are a great concern. We have them pop up periodically in our unsafe sleep death scene investigations. This is never intended as a way to put a baby to sleep. Bed sharing remains our biggest challenge. It is present uh, in so many of our deaths. Uh, emotionally, as a parent, as well as a grandparent, joining all of you, believe me, I get it. We all want to be close to our babies. Uh, here's the challenge. Uh, the, this um, on the right is a mother who has just finished nursing. She's deeply asleep. She's exhausted in her heart. She may have the best of intentions. Um, this is a baby who's lying on his belly. Uh, he's going to be wiggling. No baby lies still. He may be shifting underneath that heavy blanket that we see in the upper right corner. Uh, or he may put his face down because babies lying on their tummies just don't keep their face to the side. He may be rubbing his face on the fabric uh, between her breasts, tickling each of his cheeks, creating a rooting response, rubbing his, moving his face back and forth, and creating a, uh, a, a well in the fabric between her breasts and rebreathing oxygen poor air. If he's like most babies, he'll arouse, get that catecholamine surge, wake up, uh, and try to move his head to a safer spot. If he's that baby that we thought about in the very beginning of our conversation today, uh, who has that anomalous brainstem, 
uh, still undetectable in life. Once we get to that point, there, then there's a potential for doing more, but those conditions are undetectable in life. We can't change that. We can change safe sleep, as you know. Um, so if he is that vulnerable baby, he will continue to lie and rebreathe that oxygen poor air. Uh, and so it's important for us to make sure that we are protecting all babies because we cannot figure out which babies may be more at risk than others. And we also know that by protecting that baby, we're also protecting that baby from the other unsafe sleep circumstances uh, that yield um, a death through accidental suffocation, for example, as we talked about. The, the picture on the left is the optimal way. You are sharing your room. The baby is next to you. You can hold the baby, touch the baby. Um, that baby and you are proximate. You're not going to be compromising anything. And this is uh, what the recommendation is to date uh, by the American Academy of Pediatrics. Things that elevate the risk further are if the parent is or was a smoker, if the baby is very young, if the baby is preterm or of low birth weight, uh, if the surface is overly small or soft. And people will sometimes say, well, can't you create risk equity? Uh, you know, make, make the bed sharing situation as safe as possible. And yes, you can remove your loose bedding and uh, you can make sure that uh, you don't have pillows and bumpers and the baby's on his back. But the reality is there are still lingering differences. The adult mattress, is very different from a baby's firm flat mattress. Um, the uh, deeply sleeping adult uh, may, no matter how much the goal is to be a vigilant, somehow inadvertently create a problem uh, interacting physically with that baby in that uh, condition. And so um, the guidance remains, bring that baby into bed to feed the comfort to play, but when you're ready to go back to sleep, by the bed, not in the bed. Uh, soft bedding, such as pillows and blankets, multiple people in the bed raise risk, and some of our deaths seem involved not just the parent in bed or the parents in bed, but siblings in bed as well. A parent who's impaired in alertness because of deep fatigue or alcohol use or other sedating drugs elevates risk, and a non-parent or a guest in the, bed, in the bed elevates risk as well. Breastfeeding is associated with a lower risk, and this is these are uh, uh, Icons demonstrating uh, the guidance, and these, these were pictured on the WIC national website, by the bed, bringing the baby into nurse back again uh, by the bed. Uh, the majority of mothers who breastfed exclusively were able to do so with room sharing uh, conditions, and these were measurements taken both at two to three weeks and at two to three months and at five and six months. A real problem for breastfeeding is if a baby is sleeping in a completely different room and there's a real loss of signaling uh, uh, from the baby to the parent. Uh, and there is increased protection. We would like our breastfeeding mothers to breastfeed exclusively and for as long as possible. Um, you should also know that with respect to SIDS, if there is even any breastfeeding, uh, we are relieved to see that uh, especially for the breastfeeding beyond two months, uh, that there is uh, an impact. Um, we um, will be talking further about this in future conversations. Sudden unexpected postnatal collapse um, is a death that occurs, and by definition, there's some variations in definition. There's no code of yet available for this type of death, um, but it's a death that occurs in a seemingly healthy baby uh, in the uh, first uh, week of life, and it uh, generally would be a baby who would be over 35 weeks. It's exquisitely rare. Um, in uh, New Jersey from um, 2007 to 2018, um, I think uh, there were something like 2% uh, of uh, these deaths uh, uh, of, uh, sudden on, of sudden unexpected infant deaths uh, uh, occurred uh, within the uh, uh, the first uh, six days of life, 2% of sudden unexpected infant deaths. And some of these might have met the standard for a sudden unexpected postnatal collapse. The point is it's rare. Observational data uh, tells folks that it's associated often with asphyxiating positioning uh, in skin-to-skin -skin care. Uh, that doesn't mean that these are no-nos, absolutely not. It's important, however, to recognize that 
one must have good interventions. You have to adhere to protocols for observing the mother-infant in that early postpartum period especially. Uh, you want to avoid bedroom when the parent is drowsy or with the sleeping mother. You want to make sure that positioning of the, of the baby is vigilant, uh, 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 adhered to, and, and that there is the observation of the mother uh, in, the, in these early postpartum uh, periods. Um, the deaths were more likely compared, this is work that uh, we've been doing, uh, more likely uh, to be to uh, primiferous women if you compare the first week versus uh, uh, second to fourth week. The deaths in the first week were more likely to be primi prim to primiferous women and to women uh, who were sectioned to maybe uh, fatigue or potentially a little sedation. Uh, and so this extra vigilance really, really needs to happen and extra guidance about positioning and then we're good. Um, conversations have to be respectful. Uh, we have to appreciate that people have different belief systems. People have different de definitions of the word safety. This is a simulated reenactment. This mother went to sleep on a sofa. Uh, she put the baby between herself and the back of the sofa so the baby wouldn't roll off. She felt that was met the definition of safe. In her sleep, she lifted her arm. This is a doll reenactment, by the way. The baby fell into her axilla, and this was a death by suffocation. So we have to understand that when people say, I'm putting my baby to sleep safely, safely can mean very different things. Um, and we have to be complete in our advice. So the um, picture, in, in each of these pictures, we see that the baby has been placed on his back and props for that. But you also see that there is cluttered bedding, and in fact, the baby on the right has a cow on his nose, uh, and all of those things matter as well. And we found in a study we did a, back in 2010 that 80% of our SIDS cases had two or more concurrent risks. So we have to make sure that our advice is complete. And we also know that over time, compliance declines. This is looking at our uh, these are deaths to, to SIDS, and we see that when we look at the risk factors that were present, in the early two months, only 21% of our cases had been placed on the belly. Uh, there were other risks, but by two to four months, it represented uh, half of our cases uh, could be characterized as having been in prone sleep. So there was a big jump up. And that's why it's so important when we work with the uh, in New Jersey chapter of AAP periodically to reinvigorate the Keep It Up campaign. And in your follow-up clinics, other uh, clinics, you can certainly engage in reminders in that first year. We have to be attentive to the fact that there are a lot of products that come and go. An inclined sleeper is not recommended. And this type of product was actually either voluntarily recalled or recently or uh, recalled by requirement. The summary, back to sleep is safest. Premature babies too. I usually don't like to delve into slides that just show a bunch of numbers, but these numbers are pretty profound. Uh, sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words and sometimes a number is, and this is one of those cases. If you have a full-term baby sleeping on your back, you have a certain low level risk of SIDS. That's the referent group. If you're a preterm baby sleeping on your back, risk goes up a little bit related to some issues associated with prematurity. But if you are a preterm baby sleeping on your belly compared to that back sleeping full-term baby, you have almost 49 times the risk of uh, SIDS. And these were findings that were replicated in other studies. You can't change prematurity, but you sure can change positioning. There are rare exceptions. That's why we always ask our families to continue the conversation with healthcare, healthcare providers. One example is Pierre-Aubin syndrome. Uh, baby born, as you know, without the architecture of a lower uh, face, and that baby put on the back would have the tongue fall back, and that would occlude the airway. So obviously, you wouldn't be putting that baby on the back. But these are rare exceptions. Uh, how long should you be get used back to sleep? Again, the first year of life, but we've had that conversation at the start of our uh, presentation, that once the baby develops two skills, turning belly to back and back to belly, and uh, true skills, not just accidental whoopses, um, then it's about six months of age, then you initiate sleep on the back for the first 12 months of life, but the baby is free to move about in, in ways that he or she's learned to, be, uh, to enjoy more. Uh, safe bedding means no pillows or other loose and soft bedding, uh, uh, no 
you know, bumpers, for example, uh, crib bassinet, portable crib or player that meet current standards is what the AAP recommends. Mattress should be firm and flat. And when we say firm, we don't mean a rock. We just mean something that doesn't have the potential to sag such that when you lift your baby up, you see a dent where that baby was. You want to reassure families there's no increased risk of aspiration. You want to avoid commercial devices that uh, uh, control sleep position. This is one that was removed from the market because it had unintended consequences of creating deaths. It was slippery. This is a doll reenactment. Baby flipped over. This was a death by uh, suffocation. Uh, you want to make sure uh, that there is uh, uh, families are recognized that room sharing is what's recommended in lieu of bed sharing, uh, that there is no smoking, not by the mother, not by people in the, in the home, how smoke-free, as smoke-free as possible. You want to avoid overheating. You want to tell everybody who takes care of the baby how you're putting your baby to sleep. You know, unaccustomed belly-bound sleep and a baby is used to sleeping on the back is actually not a good thing. So if you have uh, somebody coming over, auntie's coming over to your house and says, you know, darling, you've been taking care of your baby now, so lovely, beautiful work, your baby's fabulous, you're doing it for two months, please go out, relax, I've been tested, I'm COVID free, I've had my vaccine, I'm fine, I'm going to take care of your baby, um, and auntie's 90 years old, hasn't been in a pediatrician's office in 60 years, has no clue about uh, back to sleep, promptly takes your back sleeping baby, puts it on the belly, no. So you want to make sure everybody knows how you're sleeping your baby. Educate, demonstrate, and remind. Repetition matters. Pacifiers are associated with risk reduction. You should wait a month, the guidance tells us now, uh, so that you don't have nipple competition with a breastfeeding mama. Uh, it should be uh, free of attachments. You don't want a string or a chain or a clip or anything because those can be suffocation devices. Uh, should be clean, dry, in good shape. Why does it work? Well, one theory is that it can keep the airway more patent. Another is that um, it, um, the rhythmic sucking may keep baby in a more arousable state, which is self-protective for some of the things that babies do to keep themselves uh, safe and, and, uh, and doing well. Uh, if it falls out, you don't have to spend the night recovering and placing it back in, and it should be offered, not forced. Neonatal abstinence syndrome I bring up today just to indicate that it may impact safe sleep decisions if a baby is highly irritable, so you want to work out with families how to keep those, those safe sleep practices in mind, uh, even as they're addressing uh, neonatal abstinence syndrome. And you also want to make sure that if there's a parent still using, uh, you recognize that they may adversely um, or may make decisions about safe sleep, which are inconsistent with safe sleep guidance, because the goal is just to do anything to stop the baby from crying. Uh, and so you want to make sure that there is assistance in the family and others who may be helping to take care of that baby. Another concern is potential for head flattening with back to sleep. Well, there are many reasons that can contribute to head flattening, uh, certainly torticollis and other factors, but no question if that baby is lying 24 seven on his back, uh, that that can increase the risk. Um, and so the American Academy has consistently offered these guidances to help reduce the risk. Tummy time, when a baby is awake and supervised, they never specify how much, they don't want to create uh, OCD circumstances, you know, obsessive, you know, monitoring by the clock in the minute, but as much as you can, um, that should be uh, a goal. Tummy time when the baby supervised helps improve motor development, uh, and it's, a, it's a, a very, very good thing and gives the baby relief from being on the back all the time. Also, you can alter direction of the baby in the crib. For a few nights, left arm is to the business end of the room. Next few nights, the right arm is. Babies are like us, they're curious, they turn toward the action, and they'll move their heads in both directions. But most importantly, avoid extended time. Car seats, bouncy chairs, strollers. You know, in America today, you don't ever have to pick up your baby. You put that baby into that seat, you click it into a car, you go to the store, you click it into a cart, you come home, you click it into a carriage, you go inside, you click it into a swing. No, pick up your baby, give your baby time being held, being free of having the back on the devices. These are cartoons provided by the National Institute of Child Health and Human Development. And the goal of these cartoons is to demonstrate that on the back, anatomically, the baby is actually in a better situation than on the belly. On the back, just to be exquisitely simplistic, the esophagus is 
below the trachea. Uh, it's a feeding tube. I'm not sure at what range of, of um, knowledge is in our audience. I'm going to just use a, a range of comments of how to describe this. The feeding tube uh, is below the breathing tube, the trachea. Baby vomits, it kind of would have to go against that get in, to get into the trachea. Really what happens, it lands in a pocket. There's a gag rail reflex baby coughs. On the belly, the esophagus, the feeding tube is now kind of above the trachea or the breathing tube, baby vomits, it passes uh, uh, right in front of uh, that opening, baby can inhale, aspirate, what doesn't get aspirated lands in a puddle on the sheet, baby rubs his face and it can continue to breathe that in. So uh, the guidance supports the back to sleep position, again with rare exception, and that's why speaking with one's healthcare provider is very important. Uh, examples of questions that parent we, we ask with parents. What have you heard about safe infant sleep? Do you know about what the safe, what's the safest way to put your baby to sleep? What bedding should be kept out of the crib? If anyone smokes in the home, what plan do you have? These are all ways to have a conversation and not just come in and say A, B, C, D, uh, because none of us likes that. We have questions and we have concerns and we want to have that conversation. And yes, public health education is labor intensive in a world where it's so hard to have time to do these things in depth, especially in, and specifically in the work that we all do in a hospital with a 48 hour uh, admission and so much work to be done. But this is so important. And so my job in these conversations is to make sure that, that I am making noise and being the squeaky wheel for the importance of, of this guidance standard of uh, health to provide this information. We do it in a myriad of ways. There's so many partners we work with, all these different systems that we uh, work with as well as directly with the public. But you know who the most impactful educator is? You. Everybody listening to me, think of your own action and what you can do. And finally, this is something you can find in shoe boxes. Um, it's designed to wick away moisture. And there's a message on here, I'm sure you can all see that. It says, throw away, do not eat. I don't know about any of you, I personally have never been motivated to eat it, but nevertheless, there it is, instructions. Everything comes with instructions except the baby, that's our job. And thank you so much for giving me the chance to chat with you again today about this information. Uh, and uh, thank you for all the work you do to educate our families and to keep our babies safe. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Osfeld, for sharing your research and your work that no doubt has saved countless lives. Um, we are just out of time, but I would like to squeeze one of the questions that we have. Um, it looks like your camera may be covered. But, um, one question that we did get is, how do you feel about equipment promoted to parents to make safe sleep, sleep safer, like the Owlet? We don't comment on specific products. Uh, what we do indicate is that uh, if we're all scientists, before we can say that something reduces the risk of any health issue, we actually have to have efficacy. We have to have evidence. Um, and we've all had seen misadventures where products come and go. Um, so we, we work with what the American Academy of Pediatrics outlines for us. And in their uh, policy statement and technical report. You should all have access to it and you can go on our Facebook page and download it from there or I could send it to you to distribute for anyone who doesn't have it. There's a clear description of what is helpful and what is not helpful. And that, that should be a, our guide. Any other statement goes beyond what I can offer you from a, uh, a formal perspective. Great. Okay, thank you so much. Um, and I'm sure there's more questions and anyone is welcome to contact me and we can certainly address any other questions that are out there. Um, but we really want to thank you, um, Dr. Barbara Otzfeld, as well as to Karim Amadeo, who's handling the technical back end of the program today, and for all of you who have joined us today. Thank so just you, to Yes, thank you. Um, in just about an hour, 
everyone at home will receive an email with a link to post-program evaluation. Your feedback is important, so please take the time to complete. And also make sure that your email address is correct and that's where your certificate will be sent in approximately a week. And please also check out the calendar of the partnership's upcoming virtual programs at www.partnershipmch.org under the Professional Education tab. We also have our annual maternal health and perinatal safety symposium next month and attendees will have live access to conference interactive tools and 30 days to view the recordings as well as we have an on-demand recordings of many of our programs which are listed on our website so thank you dr Ratzfeld. thank you everyone uh, who has been here for the past hour and we hope you can join us again at our next upcoming educational event